Putin, Trump, and a phone call to remember. There are a few phone conversations more memorable than the one Peter Sellers has as President of the United States with the Soviet premiere in Stanley Kubrick's classic black comedy, Dr. Strangelove. If you've ever seen it, there's a link here in the article I'll leave below for you. Note the situation. The US is the aggressor versus Russia for all the thermonuclear marbles. A rogue element within the US military decided this was necessary. Up until Tuesday evening's election results, this was a real possibility. Except it wouldn't have been an underling's decision to go to war with Russia, but rather the president herself, herself, in this case being, if it were, to come out Hillary Clinton. Thankfully, enough Americans decided, whether they were aware of it or not, not to vote for war and elect Donald Trump. Today, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and President-elect Trump had a far different phone call than the one brilliantly ad-libbed by Peter Sellers 53 years ago, and the world is a potentially much safer place than yesterday. Not Putin with up with it anymore. For all practical purposes, U.S. has been at war with Russia since 2013. Officially, no, but we haven't officially gone to war since 1941, so that's irrelevant. In a de facto sense, the Obama administration launched a hybrid war against Russia in the wake of Obama's embarrassment over his failure to get a coalition to invade Syria over a fa false flag chemical weapon attack. During those tense days, Putin swooped in to mediate a settlement which allowed Obama to save face. He cast shade on the allegations against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and got Assad to give up his chemical weapons stores to deter an invasion. After that, it has been one provocation after another. From fomenting a coup in Ukraine, to imposing economic sanctions and engineering a ruble crisis, the latest skirmish was a brazen attack on Syrian army positions outside of Bayer Azor during a brokered ceasefire agreement hard won by the two countries' top diplomats John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov. As Trump's chances to win the election improved and Hillary Clinton's anti-Russian rhetoric, rhetoric became more strident, Putin became more outspoken about the situation on the ground in Syria. His move to publicly sail a fleet to the north, from the North Sea to the Syrian coast just in time for the election was a clear signal as anyone should need that Russia was done playing nice. And if Hillary was bound and determined to atomize Syria to oust Assad so her friends in Qatar could build a gas pipeline instead of Gazprom, she would have started World War III to do it. A trio of Trumpian triumphs. Trump's election creates a trifecta of potential outcomes not possible with a Clinton victory. First, Ending hostilities in Syria is no longer a hope resting on the battle-worn SAA forces and the Russian Air Force's logistic prowess. Trump has already had an effect in Syria. Obama ordered US forces there to begin attacking Al-Qaeda forces there. This was something he refused to do for months. Obama already began bargaining with his successor, likely to save his own skin if his involvement in Hillary's shady dealings are deeper than has been revealed so far. Second, if further, it further isolates German Chancellor Angela Merkel as she attempts to hold to a hard line on Russian economic sanctions. She's doing this to appear strong in the face of local revolts in over Eastern uh, Europe and Germany. The whole of Europe is boiling with civil unrest. In one week, the European map has become a lot less hostile to Russia. Estonia, Bulgaria, and Moldova all threw out Russophobic governments since Trump was elected on Tuesday. Individually, these states have little influence on EU policy, EU meaning European Union. But in the prevailing political climate, they materially strengthen Eurosceptic movements in the core European Union states like France, Austria, and Germany itself where Merkel is struggling to hold back an insurgent rise of alternate for Germany, the ADF party, whose rise is threatening Merkel's coalition. And most importantly, 
Trump and Putin agreeing on foreign policy approaches could create a climate over the next four years to broker a lasting peace between Israel and the rest of the Arab world. Putin's maneuver to bring Turkish President Erdogan across the Syrian border to thwart any resupply of Aleppo. For the past three years, he has been strengthening ties between Russia and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel wants what Russia is selling. They also want access to Iran's markets, but want to do so under the protection of the Eurasian economic community. Trump can facilitate that by deftly removing our presence from the region after he and Putin cut off ISIS lifeblood completely, namely the oil, Syria and Iraq and US deep state, Lagres. The neocon threat. All of this comes to naught if Trump takes his foreign policy advice from some neoconservative crazies that were the architects of this madness in the first place. With the rumors swirling that Trump is considering either former UN ambassador and crazed war hawk John Bolton or former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani for Secretary of State, it doesn't bode well in the short run. That said, after Trump's victory speech, Putin's spokesman Dmitry Peskov remarked how close the two leaders are in their, quote, conceptual approach to foreign policy, end quote. He added that he was moderately optimistic for the future of U.S.-Russian relations. Trump knows he has a bad hand in negotiating with Syria, but there are a ton of chips to be brought to the table. Sanctions, relief, de-escalation of the Russian border, crafting a solution for Ukraine, etc. All of these things Trump inherits from Obama and Clinton, resetting the world back to 2013 before all this craziness began would be a legacy unto itself, one that a president could be proud of. This is by Planet Free Will and it's on the Daily Sheeple. I'll leave a link below for you for this.